Hello, BookTube. Well, as you can see, I have a guest with me. It's a, it's a best-selling author, an old friend of mine. This is William Martin. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. How are you doing? It's good I'm to see you. I'm very fine. And you are up in your in your famous writing gall gallery there, your, your upper room. Yep, uh, yep. And uh, it, some of you who have been watching the channel will know uh, that William Martin has a new book coming out this summer. Here, we'll, it's this one. It's December 41, which we've seen on this channel. Uh, yes. I opened it in a mail hall. We talked about it a bit. A whole bunch of you emailed me with what I imagine is fairly familiar to you, people who have been reading you for their whole reading lives. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, that is true. I, it's been... Um... It's been 42 years since Back Bay came out. And you used to hand sell it, as oh, I remember. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> and it was, it, you were one of the, when I worked, I worked, some of you who are new to the channel, I, for 25 years, worked in, in a retail bookstore. And you were one of the hand selling authors who made it very easy to do. <laughs> well, I, I appreciated it. <laughs> now, the Back Bay, Cape Cod, Annapolis. Uh, yep. All, all sorts of, you, you bounce all around the historical register. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, including uh, my own, for perverse reasons, my own favorite, Citizen Washington, uh, which is an absolutely terrific historical novel about George Washington. And the reason it's my perverse favorite is because I think you admire him as much as I don't. <laughs> so, yeah. so the book was you basically yeah. arguing with me the whole time, and it was just wonderful. It was a wonderful well, experience. Well, I admire him, but as with all historical characters and institutions that I've written about and I've also written about Harvard Harvard Yard and uh, uh, and the US Navy in Annapolis um, I always try to show you the uh, um, the places where the shine is off of the uh, of the icon and and Washington the Washington who emerges in that book emerged after a lot of years of study on my part uh, and I also wrote and narrated an episode of the American Experience about Washington uh, that came out about 30 years ago. I learned a lot about him. And my goal with that one and with all the historical fiction I've written is to show you uh, not only the best of, uh, of American history, but the dark corners as well. And you yeah. see that with Washington. Yeah, the dark threads are definitely there. And for instance, Annapolis, you don't shy away from them at all. In that no. And no. A, a recent novel of yours about the California gold rush. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Uh, managed, you managed to capture just marvelously the sense of adventure, which is what would make the subject so interesting on, you know, just a surface level. But yeah. you also captured all of the, the deeper, more yeah. tangled stuff, the desperation involved. Which well, is really the, neat. that's a... The California gold rush to my mind, and the book was called Bound for Gold, and it was actually based on the first screenplay that I ever wrote. Um, and to my mind, the California gold rush is, the, is the, the first place where you can actually say America is a melting pot. And you dump in people from all over the world. Uh, from, and the, the first place that most inhabitants of this continent of white European descent uh, had ever encountered Asian people, the large influx of Chinese, plus the Mexicans who had harbored enormous resentment over the fact that up until two years before they discovered gold, uh, that place belonged to them. And so you have all of these people mixed together and uh, not only does the desperation of each individual emerge in their hunt for gold, but also the, uh, the natural inclination of human beings to blame the other, to blame the Chinese or blame the Mexicans and drive them out and so forth. All of that stuff it works into the book. It's an incredibly uh, rich environment for drama of every, of every kind. And that was, that was why I was drawn back to it after 40 years. I first wrote the screenplay to that novel uh, when I was in film school at USC. Wow. Uh, and looked around at all of my friends in the mid-70s, uh, all of us with our California dreams and our visions of Hollywood wealth, and thought to myself, for 150 years or, or so, 
California has been the land of dreams like this. Maybe for my first script, I'll go back and write about the first dream, which was mm -hmm. the gold rush. And, um, and that, that screenplay won, won me awards. Mm -hmm. Got my name on the cover of Variety when I was uh, 27 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, got me an agent. And so I owed those characters uh, a chance to come back and reassert themselves, which is what I did in my last novel, Bound for Gold. But what I, but what I did with that book was, uh, and I had carried this in my head for all these years, I said, the first two, two acts of the novel, and it's almost like a play in, the, in, its, in its structure. The first two acts of the novel were in the screenplay, but when the characters write off at the end, there's one more act, there's one more series of events that I have to explore in order to define them. And that's what I did in, in that novel. And that description, that the, what you described there, that sort of historic, but also panoramic look at a subject or a time period or an institution, it feels like this book is a bit of a departure. It is, from yeah, that. yeah. And that, that, because this is, this is being marketed, I'm sure that the marketing is accurate as a thriller. Yes. It's still historical. Yeah. America, you know, just on the eve of full participation in World War II. Right. That's a, that's a tense, really dicey period that a lot of Americans don't get instructed about what that's that true. America was like. Yeah. But, uh, but I showed this, this, uh, this review copy to a friend of mine and he said, where's the rest of it? <laughs> because the William Martin novels tend to be a little bit more I know. elaborate, a little bit longer. He wanted to know why it, it, it was shorter. I'm assuming that's because you're trying something new here, right? I am. Yeah. Could you go in, uh, go into a little detail about what that's like? I mean, surely the instinct that you've built up over 50 years must have been to write 600 pages about America on the eve of World War II. But right. instead, thrillers Absolutely. have different priorities, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when, when I pick up a thriller, I like to pick up one that, that I have the sense will, will move quickly for me and, and that I will uh, find find so compelling a read that I just keep turning those pages. And when you're presented with a big, thick, daunting book, uh, you have to bring a different set of, as a reader, a different set of um, mental expectations to the, to the challenge. And as fr from the writing point of view, I had heard from so many friends, you know, Bill, you take so long to write these books. Like, <laughs> It took uh, four years, five years for Bound for Gold to come out. And I wanted to write something more quickly. You take so long to write these books. Why don't you write something that just takes place in a couple of weeks? And the book, D December 41, begins the day after Pearl Harbor. It begins with FDR giving his speech before Congress. And then we follow his voice out across the uh, the American landscape until the radios are playing in Los Angeles where different people are listening to his speech, including a German agent whose job it will be uh, to get on a train and get himself to Washington to shoot FDR on the night he lights the Christmas tree. When I got that idea and I shared it with a few friends on my age and everybody said, fantastic, that's the novel, that's the thriller. And, um, and so once I had all of that, uh, th that plot, I just, I knew I just had to write the book. Sometimes a book will just scream out, you've got to write me. And December 41 was that kind of book with me. It ended up taking me a couple of years to write, but uh, that's just the way I work. And um, did you uh, find yourself arguing with yourself at any point? Were your instincts always, oh, we need more detail here at the expense of maybe the momentum well, of the plot? Right. Well, what happened was that the book is laid out like um, every day becomes a chapter. There's no chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It's, it's December 8th, 1941, December 9th, 1941. And on each day, something happens. And it's broken into three parts, three act structure, three parts. Um, in LA, on the train, and 
finally in Washington, D.C. And in each of those days, uh, I gave you not only, not only the, the main characters, the thriller aspects of the story, et cetera, I also gave you uh, a little bit of drama about where Roosevelt was in his mind at that moment, where he was in his relationship to Winston Churchill, uh, because actually the, the idea came to me while I was watching the movie uh, Darkest Hours with uh, Gary Oldman as Churchill. And that in the scene where Churchill gets off the phone with FDR and he's crestfallen over the fact that FDR can't help him. I was watching that and I thought in a year, those two guys are going to be together in the White House over Christmas, deciding how they're going to stop fascism in two hemispheres. And, uh, and out of that emerged this, this, this plot because the German agent will get to Washington and he's going to open the newspaper on, the, on December 23rd and see a photograph of Churchill and FDR together on the front lawn. And uh, the fact is that Churchill that night gave this ringing speech after FDR had given his speech uh, right there from the, uh, the portico of the uh, White House. And then they lit the tree. And what I did in order to get to that point, almost and almost to mirror the book by um, Eric Larson, uh, The Splendid and the Vile, which was such a huge hit last year or the year before, um, almost to, to, to capture a little bit of that atmosphere, I gave you Churchill and Roosevelt almost every day. I was in the White House with them and so forth. I wrote all of that. And then a couple of uh, my professional readers said, you know, it's kind of, it feels a little slow. Uh, can, you, can you do something to speed it up? And I looked at it all uh, and I had read the book about three times now and I, I saw what uh, was going on with the main characters and I just, kept asking myself, now, why are we reading this scene with FDR? Is this advancing the plot? Is this enhancing the main characters? Is this driving the story down that track that you're always trying to put a good story on? And I, I couldn't say that it was. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I made the, the difficult decision uh, to cut about 65 pages, shoo, right out of the book. Oh, wow. It was easy to cut because I knew exactly where to go in every chapter. And um, the book in a way is enhanced because uh, now there's all, it's almost a surprise when the German agent opens that paper and sees Churchill and says, oh boy, now I can get them both. <laughs> and um, uh, so even with this book, I was, I was confronting the issue of how much history to leave in and how much history to take out. I should point out <laughs> for readers or viewers who might not, might not have read your books, that no matter how much history you put in, <laughs> they still end up being mighty page turningly readable. I'll yes. never forget a, a customer that I had once. She was asking, can you give me something that I just, I just want to be totally absorbed in a book and you always give me good recommendations. I recommended Harvard Yard. And oh. she looked at me over her, you know, her back bay glasses and said, well, I don't know anything about Harvard and look at the size of this thing. And it's, I, I, this certainly won't work. And she came back to me two weeks later and said, I wanted it to be longer. Yeah. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get right. enough of it. <laughs> I love it. Well, but, but that's the opposite of what you're doing here. I've, I've talked to thriller writers who say that the key is to cut stuff out, just cut out yeah. living flesh, mm -hmm. even stuff you really like. Yes. Yeah, and I, I liked having all of those interactions with FDR and Churchill, and there was an enormous amount of research that emerged. Churchill, Churchill came over on a battleship, the HMS Duke of York, which was the sister ship of, uh, of Prince of Wales, which had been sunk in the uh, 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 Far East a few weeks earlier. And uh, 
they, they sailed under very difficult conditions across a very stormy North Atlantic. And uh, Churchill called it the, the, the hardest and longest week of the war for him to be on that ship pounding along. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's all kinds of detailing that I put into it that I, that I had to take out of it. But that's just part of the instinct of, um, of understanding how to tell a story after 40 years. Uh, understanding, and, and that first book that I wrote, Back Bay, came out 40, 42 years ago now. Wow. Um, the, the, the understanding of the salient details uh, that will make a period, a moment in time, come to life for a reader mm -hmm. uh, versus the overwhelming amount of detail that you carry in your head that you want to put onto the page that you hope in some way will uh, give the reader a sense of verisimilitude when, you know, if you can just find that one thing that gives somebody a sense of being in the right place and at the right time. Like with the opening of Back Bay, my first novel, I can recite the first paragraph even today. Horace Taylor Pratt, pulled a silver snuff box from his waistcoat pocket and placed it on the table in front of him. He hated snuff boxes. It was small, delicate, and nearly impossible for a man with one arm to open. Whenever he fumbled for snuff, he cursed the two-armed world that conspired against him. But when he wanted a clear head, he had to have snuff. And tonight, he wanted wits as sharp as a glass cutter. That's the first paragraph of that book. And already you're in the 18th century with a guy who's taking snuff, you know, and that, that's his stimulant. And that you know, you very much wouldn't be if you'd made the, you know, the tempting other decision to start it with a figure in marble like Jefferson or Adams. Right, you right. You wouldn't be there if you hadn't and made Adams, that decision. You... Adams, the scene is about, the camera's about to pull out in that scene to a banquet in Faneuil Hall that actually happened. And sitting at the head table that night are John Adams and John Hancock and George Washington in between them. Uh, so you're right that I, I could have started with those guys, but if you start with that tiny detail, uh, that will stick in the reader's head. This guy is putting us right there in the 18th century. And, or wherever, uh, because you yeah. do that in all of your books. The, yeah. that, you, that can, little... you can put December 41 down now, Steve. You, <laughs> I want to make sure people recognize it because they're going to be seeing it. <laughs> We're going to be yeah. seeing it again. But that, when you say that, uh, that automatically makes me curious. You, you mentioned that even this book, which is shorter than most of your books, yeah. took years to do. And you, yeah. I, I, I totally believe the hours and hours of research that then had to be some of it left on the, on the cutting room floor. Right. But I'm curious to know uh, how you make the decision to get that whole apparatus going in the first place. I'm not, I'm not asking the dreaded author question, where do you get your ideas? <laughs> what, yeah. I'm, what I'm asking is, how do you pick which one is a runner? Which one will actually, because it, it's a big apparatus, right? Yes. It's, you, it's lots of, it's not only lots of people involved down the line, but it's lots, you can't help yourself. You do huge amounts of backgrounding and research. Yeah. You yeah. don't want to start up that mechanism for a non-starter. I know, you're right. You have given so many writing seminars over the years. How, how do you decide well, which is a likely know, thing? A lot of it is instinct. A lot of it is uh, when I float an idea, uh, just seeing what gets a good reaction. When I, um, uh, when I just feel like this is the one that I have to write. And Right, you um, mentioned some books just to ask you to write them. Right, Cape Cod, for example. I knew after I finished Back Bay that someday I was going to write one like Back Bay about the Cape. It took me a few years to get there, but um, eventually I did. And that, that book, uh, my agent loved the idea. And my agent 
is, is one of the few people I really listen to uh, because he sometimes gives me good ideas. Uh, and he's got a, a long and successful record as a, as a representative of um, writers of commercial fiction from Tom Clancy to uh, Catherine Coulter uh, um, to people like Mark Greeny today. Uh, who writes the Gray Man series, which is about to become a big uh, miniseries. And, and so I've always given his opinions uh, a lot of thought. Right now, I'm kind of stuck. I'm not sure what I'll write. And, I, and uh, he's given me an idea that I don't particularly love. So I'm <laughs> just not going to write it. You know, as I get older, um, I, I begin to feel on the one hand, the, uh, the pressure to take advantage of the time I have as a writer. But on the other hand, I don't feel the, uh, the financial pressures because there are no more college educations to worry about and no more mortgages to worry about. So I want to pick the idea that I want to write um, and I don't want to make a mistake in doing it. But like, Sometimes with a novel, all you have to do is say one word and you don't even have to make a proposal. I had a two book deal uh, with my present publisher, Forge, and right now, the, December 41 is the end of a two book deal. But um, I wrote City of Dreams, uh, which was like Back Bay set in Manhattan. And, um, and then I was out for drinks, with my editor, we were at a, a party where we a bunch of people around and he said, hey, have you thought about the next book you wanna write? And I said, I wanna do a novel about Lincoln. And I even have the title. I'm gonna call it The Lincoln Letter. I love it, write it, boom. You, you say you're going to do something about Lincoln, you, you are automatically uh, given the green light. And I had a fantastic time writing that book. Um, I, it, it exhausted the hell out of me because it took me about, it, it, I did that one in two years and, and that was a pretty big one. Uh, I covered the whole civil war in that one. Yeah. In addition to a modern story. Two years. Yeah. Uh, but then as with the gold rush story, I had, had, a, once I settled on it and, you know, I, I, had had another conversation in my, with my editor in which he'd said, you know, there's a great novel in the gold rush. And I said, be careful what you wish for. Um, he later tried to, to, to backtrack and he wanted me to do something else. But I said, no, you got to do this one, you know? And so I did it. And um, I'm glad I did. Took me a little bit too long, but um, they all do. You know, I've been at this all these years and I've only got 12 novels. Uh, along with along with the PBS American well, Experience. Well, you've only got 12 and, novels, but haven't all 12 of them been New York Times bestsellers? <laughs> not, not all of them, but they've all been bestsellers someplace along the way. And, and many of them have been New York Times bestsellers. So I've been fortunate in that regard. Um, the, the temptation but, uh, that writers, once writers have the colleges paid for and the mortgage paid for, a lot of times the temptation when the gray starts to creep into the hair is to write yeah. a memoir. Yes. Is that You'll get no memoirs for you? from me. <laughs> no memoirs my, from you. My, uh, all of my adventures have taken place in this room, or, or <laughs> most of them. You know, I've been coming up here, as I say now, I, well, Back Bay bought this house, and then my that was my first novel, and my second novel heated this house, and subsequent novels have put additions on, and um, uh, when I come up here, I know I'm sitting down to my time machine, and I'm talking to you on the time machine right now, <laughs> and um, when I'm when I'm really cooking along and I'm really enjoying what I'm writing, I'll sit down here in the morning and I'll say, where am I going now? And as in December 41, the, the scene, scenes on the super chief, because the characters, the good guys and the bad guys through uh, a series of dramatic complications end up together on the train. And um, I just had a wonderful time researching the, uh, 
the life of people who uh, cross the country on a regular basis on these what it was the super chief was called the grand hotel on wheels mm. and uh people lived very very uh comfortably uh even as war was starting soon soon enough the uh, the comforts of the super chief would be taken away and there'd be more and more people traveling and there wouldn't be room for the kinds of high quality living that um uh, the super chief presented, but uh, with Citizen Washington, it was the same way. I had 12 different narrators telling the story of George Washington's life. And, and of course, in the, in the process of telling the story of Washington's life, they're really telling the story of their own lives. So you have these 12, these 12 narrative arcs and we have fictional characters like a Mount Vernon slave who gets to uh, who gets to open the book. He's the first narrator and he's the last narrator basically. Um, and you also get figures like Alexander Hamilton and Jefferson and Adams and all of them. And every day I would come up here and I'd sit down at the desk and I would say, who do I wanna to be today? <laughs> whose voice will I write in today? Uh, and that, that was really a wonderful and liberating experience as well. But it took a lot of research for me to get to the point where I could capture the sounds of their voices and the concerns right. and the issues you of can't, their You lives. can't do that while you're amassing notes. That has right. to be the product of, right. of synergizing it all once you're done. Yeah. But, yeah. but I wonder... But, but, uh, was, but once, once I'm... Once I'm done telling you about writing novels or working for Roger Corman in Hollywood on a, on a cult classic horror movie <laughs> or working in construction when I was a, a young man uh, in, in Boston where I helped the bricklayers and built the stagings on jobs like the uh, First National Bank building on Federal Street the Marion Manor nursing home in South Boston, places like that. Once I'm done telling you stories like that, it, it's, um, it's a fairly dull life. <laughs> but as Flaubert said, I must be orderly and boring in my daily life so that I can be extraordinary in my work. <laughs> but is, is there uh, an element of burnout? You mentioned, for instance, that, that the publishing world will just say Im an immediate yes to anything connected with Lincoln. Yes, yeah. And I think they'll largely do that with the same thing with anything connected with Roosevelt and World War II. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're writing a book, like, I'm gonna wave it around again. <laughs> when you're writing a book like this, when you get to the end, are you, are you surfeited on the subject or does it maybe occur to you to maybe do a, you know, a Citizen Roosevelt type thing? a much bigger, a, a yeah. standard William Martin production that is Roosevelt through the war. Right. That's, I, that's a, a thing that you're, that the publishing world would snap up. Yes. <laughs> that, would a, that would be a hell of an idea, wouldn't it? I've thought from time to time of doing something like that about Eisenhower. Um, mm. such, he's a pretty interesting character. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, um, yes. But when I finish a novel, I might be exhausted. I might be burned out. Like, Lincoln, I, because I wrote it so hard and so fast, because once I settled on the idea, we had a definite target date that we had to hit. Uh, September 12th, uh, 2012 was the goal, because that was the 150th anniversary of the promulgation of the Emancipation Proclamation. And the Emancipation Proclamation figures prominently in the novel. So I was pretty exhausted with the Lincoln book when it was over. But while I was sitting around doing nothing, um, I was just thinking, God, I hate leaving those characters behind, the historical characters. And um, I've been trying to hatch a, a means by which they could come back, uh, the ones that ride off into the sunset at the end and revisit them. And the same with the uh, characters in December 41. Um, it, you know, it has a black and white cover. 
you can hold it up again <laughs> there if you want. The, the cover is in black and white because there's a kind of film noirish vision behind the whole thing. Um, there are lots of characters that you might sense are types in film noir or early Hitchcock, you know, the 1940s, things like Saboteur and um, uh, Lady, The Lady Vanishes and things like that, um, or Foreign Correspondent. And one of the little promotional things that I will do on Facebook when the book comes out is to uh, create a cast based on black and white studio portraits from the era of the main characters in, in the story. Like the main female character is this down on her luck young actress who is told from time to time that she looks a little like the young Marlena Dietrich. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll have that. And, um, and there's a, almost a running joke in the book that, that the German agent uh, who has been seen, people, people have encountered him here and there, looks a lot like Leslie Howard. <laughs> and, and that's one of the good things. He looks like such a mild-mannered character. Um, which which makes it uh, quite a surprise when he's as uh, violent and dangerous as he turns out to be. So, um, you know, I lived in that film noir world and um, the main character, the hero, they're all sort of main characters, there are about six main characters, but the, the real hero in the book, the wrong man, you know, the Hitchcockian a uh, character who is accused and is now running from the law and running toward some kind of um, climax in Washington. Um, he is a, uh, a reader at Warner Brothers. And on December 8th, he's in the room when they drop, they're all listening to the radio and listening to Roosevelt's speech when they drop the mail from uh, from New York on the desk, and and this is a this is a fact. On that day, December eighth, nineteen forty one, one of the uh, pieces of material that was delivered to the studio to be uh, analyzed by a reader making a dollar twelve an hour um, was a play called "Everybody Comes to Rick's." which will become Casablanca, of course. Oh, and he, wow. he, writes the, um, uh, he writes the report, the reader's report, and submits it actually on the day that it was submitted, which was uh, uh, December 12th, the day Hitler declared war on America. There's all these, so anyway, there's, the cover is black and white because the sensibility behind the book is almost like a black and white 1940s movie. That's, that's what I set out to do with this and um, got to watch a lot of 1940s movies that I hadn't seen in a long time. Pure research. Yes. Right, right. Well, you know, watching the way that Michael Curtiz moves the camera in Casablanca is not only an aesthetically pleasing thing under any circumstances, but when you can call it research, it's even better. Well, there you go. We can end with that. That is, yeah. the, if that isn't, if that isn't sold you on this book, I don't know what will. But maybe you'll come back. I would love to. Again in June, closer to when the book is appearing. Sure. <laughs> Although sure, I don't think it's going to need much help. When I have a million more questions, of course. <laughs> I'd, I'd love thank to you. answer. Thank you very much for taking Thanks. time out. Thanks uh, for having me, and it's always great to see you. Well, we'll talk later. Good. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll say goodbye to everybody out there in Book Two Land, <laughs> and we'll we'll talk again later as well. Thank okay. you.